So after completing our year-long series in the letter of 1 Corinthians, this is a more topical series that we're embarking into. And the first conversation that we're focusing on for today is the one that Jesus has with a man by the name of none other than Nicodemus. So we ask you that if you've got your Bibles here, it was supposed to be on the screens, but it's not there. If you don't have your Bibles, you're new to church, if you haven't used the Bible in a while, I'll just read along and you can listen to me. But this is found in John chapter 3, okay? So if, please, you can turn there with me. That's where we will be focusing for the rest of today's sermon. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Just give you a few seconds. As you turn there, I would like to focus this passage by splitting it up into three different teaching sections, okay? Again, it would have been on the screen, so that's why I'm going to tell you about them. The first section we're going to talk about is the sinner's weight, okay? We're going to identify that. The second section will talk about the Spirit's work. And the third teaching section will be about the Savior's way. So that you remember, the first word starts with an S, the second word starts with a W, all right? So... What did I say? The sinner's weight, the spirit's work, and the Savior's way. Let's start point number one, the sinner's weight. John chapter 3, we'll begin with verses 1 through 3, and then we'll walk through it in the remainder of the sermon. And it says, There was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him at night and said, Rabbi, or teacher, this is Jesus, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. No one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. And Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So we can see that there's a disconnection between Nicodemus' first comments and the way Jesus responds. And there's a reason for that. But I want to tell you before we explain that a story. Okay, um, Liz, you had a, a crazy story of your experience. I could tell stories too, all right? But it's a true story. Um, we were at one of our road trips, and there was a time that my two older kids almost drowned, okay? We were in Texas camping because if you know me, you know that I'm, I'm a risk taker when it comes to things. And so... There was a river, right, that we're not used to. We're used to salt water. We're used to pool water. And you know that you float in that type of water. But not in river water with a lot of um, current, right? And so I said, let's just go out on a float and go into the middle of the river and, and let the current take us. And myself, as well as Anjali, we're, we're more of the risk takers. And we're out there. And Anjali decides to reach over to try to get something in the river and the floaty flips over, right? But I have this confidence, right? I'm, I'm not, I'm, nothing's going to happen to me. Have you seen how strong I am? I could swim. I could swim with both my kids. If anything happens, I'm saying that was a conversation I was having with Marilyn before we went out because she was warning me to be careful. I said, me, be careful. Man, I could do it. I've got enough strength in myself. And so when the floaty did flip over, I had, in the first few seconds, I had no worry. I'd say, oh, I'll just swim back with my kids to the shore. But I realized that we were sinking like rocks, and I could not keep up. And at that time, it was the first time we went on a road trip, so my kids were a lot younger. And I realized that after 10 seconds, then 15 seconds, and then 20 seconds of me fighting to try to keep my kids afloat, and me underwater drinking water, it did cross through my head, oh, my goodness. This is it for us. And of course, I've got my two kids there. And you have Marilyn on the outside of the shore, <laughs> just freaking out with Emily, and, and hopelessly not being able to do anything. Until, and it had to have been the Holy Spirit, that came into Angeli. And as I was trying to bubble myself and, and speak, I said, guys, just try to doggy paddle yourself up. The current was so strong, we couldn't swing back. But I guess, like I said, the Holy Spirit indwelt Angeli at that time and gave her strength and the thought to, you know what, I'm going to swim to shore. 
and by herself she swam to shore, which then gave me the opportunity to hold up Lucas, right? And then, of course, at that point, people had seen us, and they grabbed us and were able to rescue us, right? Oh, yeah, it freaked us out, definitely. And it gave me a reality check that I'm not as strong as I, th I think I am <laughs> and that the water can overtake me. But let's take a look now as we focus back on our passage. There are a few immediate realities we can see in just verse 1. Firstly, John, the, the author, wants us to know exactly who Jesus is having a conversation with. You see, we'll talk about different people in this series. For example, the woman at the well. And we didn't have her name, right? We, we don't know who she is exactly, except for that she's in the town of Samaria. And she is, as we know her, the woman at the well. But we do have clearly who this is. It's a man uh, from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews. And this is an extremely loaded reality. Commentators will spend pages upon pages describing what this signifies. But for us, I, I just want to summarize Nicodemus's resume by highlighting a few things. Uh, most of you know that children in this culture weren't given names randomly, right? If you were given a name, it had a meaning that signified one's life experience or family. It would then serve as the purpose and trajectory that would push children forward so that they could represent properly what the name was that was given to them. Nicodemus, for example, was a powerful Greek name given to this Jewish ruler, meaning victor over the people. It's where we get the word Nike or Nike, right? That means triumph or victory. This means that Nicodemus had a plan established by his parents since the day he was born to to be a, a man of influence, an elevated name of wealth and power and prestige. He was important and recognized, right, with respect. He worked hard and had education. Culturally, you weren't born randomly into a class of people. You were born into a class that you would grow up in, and that would be your significance. But most of all, he was a man of religious uprightness, right? In whom all people would see as a model of authority. If he walked into this room, most people would say, I want to be that guy, right? That's the type of man now. So we get the context that is speaking to Jesus. More than all that I just said, he was also a Pharisee and a high-ranking member of the Sanhedrin, which meant that he had religious and governmental jurisdiction over the people of Jerusalem. The Sanhedrin was like the supreme court that served even within the Roman Empire. That's why we know that Pontius Pilate appeals to the Sanhedrin before they crucify Jesus. That's saying that they had power and authority, right? And he is a high-ranking member of the Sanhedrin, a person who is focused on external do's and don'ts, right? Precepts and principles, checks and balances for himself and for the people that he's ruling. Make sense so far? And yet, and yet, this man comes to Jesus, which would have been radical for him to do. This is not a man that's supposed to be meeting and and gathering insight or information from Jesus. Because despite all the characteristics that he had that would make mommy and daddy proud, still something is a weight within his soul that leads him to search for answers from Jesus. He comes to Jesus. And he comes to Jesus, as we can read also, at night, right? Which says that he didn't want people to see him meeting with Jesus. And it also gave him the opportunity to have an uninterrupted conversation with Jesus, where, where we have now probably what is one of the most important conversations in human history. It's where we get the term born-again Christian from. It's where we have John 316 
which, as we know, is probably the most popular verse in all of Scripture. But why does Nicodemus come to Jesus to begin with? That's why point number one for us today is the sinner's weight. No one comes to Jesus, especially not Nicodemus, especially not at night, if it isn't that there are unanswered questions weighing down his soul. In biblical terms, we call this very simply the weight of sin. Maybe Nicodemus doesn't realize or think he's a sinner, but he, he feels it. He knows something is weighing down his soul. And I would venture out to say that like me in the river, unable to carry the, the, the load of my children to save their lives, he is at a point where no matter how much he strives, no matter how much he tries, something is weighing down that he cannot carry anymore. It's there. The weight of sin is there. And, and we become professional people that like to mask the weight. We like to numb that weight. We love to cope with that weight. But what Nicodemus does is he comes to Jesus to deal with that weight. A skeptic, a, a questioner, but, but a religious skeptic, expecting to get a religious response. And what was Jesus' response? Well, verse 3, he tells us, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now that's as unreligious of an answer that a person can receive, which literally leaves an educated man like Nicodemus dumbfounded, if we're honest. In fact, when I'm honest, reading this at face value, I've always questioned, what does Jesus' reply have to do with Nicodemus' comments? But, but Jesus knows. He knows why he's come to him. He knows who he is. He, he knows what he's searching for. He sees the weight and the longings of his heart. And we know this because if we see the last verse before chapter 3, chapter 2, verse 25, it tells us who Jesus is. John 2, 25, it says, Because he did not need anyone to testify about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Therefore, Jesus, being the perfect counselor that he is, speaks directly into Nicodemus' soul and addresses him for why he truly has come to Jesus. He sees what every man and woman needs. And then he took a straight shot to his heart by addressing that need. We're calling it the sinner's weight. And he tells him the way you deal with that weight is to be born again. But what does that mean exactly? Have you, you ever asked yourself if you've grown up in a religious exposure or in church? Have you ever asked what it means to be born again? I've heard the term we can identify in government papers that we're born again Christians and check that off. But what does it really mean to be born again? Leads us into the second point. The Spirit's work. The Spirit's work. Continue with me in verse 4. Nicodemus replies, How can anyone be born when he is old? <laughs> can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? That's why I had to describe who Nicodemus was. Truly, he was an educated man that had civil authority in making decisions. And he asked Jesus, do I have to be born and crawl back into my mother's womb? Is that what you're saying? Verse 5, Jesus answered, truly I tell you, unless someone is born of water, and please remember that term, church, and the Spirit, also remember that term. Again, he reiterates, he cannot... Enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. So that means there, whatever you do in your flesh produces flesh results. 
And whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Verse 7, do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from and where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus asks again, how can these things be? And Jesus then asks, are you the teacher of Israel and don't know these things? Okay, Nicodemus, if he was in Miami, we'd probably refer to him as Nico, right? <laughs> so, Nico, I I'm with you, okay? If I were in your shoes, I'd, I'd be confused as well. But what we can see is happening again is that Jesus, again, is, is identifying with the weight in Nicodemus' heart. And I know I'm repeating that a lot. Because I know that there are people that carry that same weight. And, and the people that we're referring ourselves to are the people that know a thing or two about church. Okay? Know how to function in church gatherings. And never deal with the weight in their heart. We know that Jesus is speaking directly into the weight within Nicodemus' heart. We know this because without Nicodemus asking, this is the second time Jesus references that one cannot, cannot enter the kingdom of God without rebirth. We also can assume that Jesus' comments are frustrating, maybe, Nicodemus, because of how Nicodemus responds. I mean, I would respond the same way. Jesus, how can, how can this be? I mean, how could a person, again, enter their mother's womb? I mean, how ridiculous is that, right? I mean, incredible that he would ask that. But it's clear that there is a huge gap uh, between Nicodemus' works-oriented rationale and the weight within his heart. He's thinking, Jesus, what do I need to do or how can I perform? Come on, teacher, please teach me something. You come from God. Teach me what I, what I must do. If you're saying I need to go back into my mother's womb, I'm a person that makes things happen, okay? I could, I could probably accomplish that. I mean, that's who Nicodemus is. He's a man of the law. He, he, they follow rules and laws that, that God never gave. That was the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. This is why the metaphor of being born again is so radical, especially to Nicodemus. Because no one can do a thing to be born, not even physically. No amount of work that we do would get ourselves born as a baby. Maybe your parents have to put some effort in action and then you'll get born, but that has nothing to do with us. TMI, I know. But I was meeting with a couple this week, and, and this just confirmed exactly what, what God wanted to speak to us this morning about. Because one of them was sharing with me how she was an active part of her church, doing what she thought were their, all, all the right external things, but her soul was, was exhausted, was the word that she used, right? She was a an active, faithful, church-going member. But this is what she said. But my soul was exhausted, restless, uh, tired, that it led to my deep depression and anxiety, is what she said. That's why we, we've called it wait. Because trying to serve God without the Spirit's work is the most exhausting thing that a person can ever do. And for the religious person, this becomes my worldview toward living. We talk about this in our pastor's meetings, um, and it's so cool because I grew up in church. I grew up doing a lot for the service of the Lord. Since I was a child, we would sleep till 3, 4 in the morning, especially if you grew up in the church back in the 80s. We were at church five, six days a week. And if there was a, a, a musical, we were there till five in the morning practicing. So, not like Jose, who, who got saved at 23. 
But what we talk about is that serving the Lord becomes a worldview that we carry. That becomes our means of functioning for God. I do more for God in order to deal with my weight. Well, my weight is still there, so I'll, I need to now do even more for God. Now I messed up, so let me just keep doing to make up how I messed up. I feel unwanted around the people that I'm with, so let me, let me try to perform my way to gain my wantedness. I feel unworthy and unimportant, so let me, let me perform. And all the while, what's happening is that there's a weight. There's a weight in our hearts, in our souls. Because I'm trying, I'm trying to deal with that weight without, point two, the Spirit's work. In other words, I know God is there. I do believe Him, and, and I want to live for Him, but there's a gap between my resting in the Holy Spirit, in the finished work of Jesus Christ in my place, before God's rest over my soul, and there's a gap between the good and bad external behaviors that I feel that I need to continue to perform in order to appease to God and to the people around me. This is what Jesus is beginning to open up Nicodemus's eyes to when he says in verse 5, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born of water, remember, remember, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now this is so radical, church, for a person like Nicodemus. It's also foreign to many checkbox check Christians that attend church, right? Which is why he tells Nicodemus, you're a teacher of Israel. You should know this. And I know... I know that sometimes we can identify with Nicodemus. But I love how Jesus says teacher of Israel rather than teacher of the law because Nicodemus knew the law, right? He was far, he, he was far from leading the people to God, but he knew the law. So that's why Jesus points to him being, hey, hey, but aren't you supposed to be the teacher of Israel so that you can close that gap between what they're doing and who God is for them so that they can find their rest. You should know this, Nicodemus. If you would have remembered the multiple promises and prophecies and psalms that were sung and written of the hope that belonged to Israel for generations past until his day. And we can reference different parts of Scripture, but I think the, the best one is Ezekiel 36, verses 24 to 28. Would have been on the screens, but I ask that if you turn there with me quickly, Ezekiel 36, 24 to 28. And I'll just read it. You can listen along. It says, For I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries, and I will bring you into your own land. I will also sprinkle clean water on you. There's the term of water metaphor again. And you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. I will give you, listen to this, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Please pay attention to verse 27. I will place my spirit, there's a spirit there again, within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances you will live in the land that i gave your fathers you will be my people and i will be your god i will save you from all your uncleanliness and so much we could talk about that prophecy but just as a reference for john chapter 3 as a religious leader and teacher isn't it your role to lead people to the everlasting hope of the kingdom of God? Yes, it's my role. That's why we put a burden on people and we hold the standard high. And if you don't function according to that standard, then you don't deserve or belong to be in the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, well, who's, who's the standard of that? 
How, what, what does it take to measure up? Is it you, Nicodemus? Is it your posse in the Sanhedrin? Shouldn't the standard be God himself and him alone? Nicodemus, if you think you have a handle of the standard of what it means to live for the kingdom of God, then why are we even meeting? You know very well that no matter how good you think you are, Nicodemus, you can't deny that as much goodness that you try to do, there is a weight. There's a weight. That's why you must be born again, born of the Spirit. Now, born again means a loaded term, but there's, it's very simple. Born again means a new life, a new beginning, a new worldview, a new outlook, a new purpose for living, a, a new reason to exist, and it's all available to us, and there's nothing we can do to earn it. That's why he said, I will put my spirit, says the Lord. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Why flesh? Because that will be the new heart that will be responsive to Jesus. That will be the new heart that will receive by faith who Jesus is for me. Stone, you, you can't touch it. You, stone, you, you can't feel anything. Stone is unresponsive. Which leads us to our final point for today. We'll never deal with the sinner's weight without the Spirit's work. And it's the Spirit's work that will lead us into the Savior's way. Look at verse 11. And we'll, with this we'll finish reading. Truly I tell you, we speak what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but you do not accept our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven. What he's saying there is that there is no way you can get to heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world through their works, Nicodemus, but to save the world through him. Therefore, anyone who believes in him is not condemned. But anyone, no matter what the deeds are or not, anyone who does not believe is already condemned. Everyone is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only son of God. As we close, I would love to note something very important about the context of John 3.16. The proper context of it is a conversation between John, I'm sorry, Nicodemus, a religious man, and Jesus. But even till this day, it's common to treat the term born-again Christian as something that applies, right, for more broken people. Right? That drug addict over there, that person out there really messed up, that person needs to be born again. <laughs> Not good people that appear to be pretty godly. <laughs> you, need a, you need new birth if you're unstable in your life. You know, you, you need a turnaround in your life. Uh, uh, you, you need something to help you with, your, you, with the path of your life. Get you in the right track. Hopefully then your new birth will lead you to a structure in your life or, or authority in, in, in something that is messed up. Hopefully you'll then church, join a church or a religious movement that will help you with your, the reformation of your life. Um, I, I'm, I'm an improved person now. I'm ahead of the game now. 
And then you'll probably be that person that comes in on a church stage and gives the testimony on how I was a person that used to be so despicable and lost. I mean, dead in my societal sins. And look how Jesus gave me new birth. That's what you said, Pastor Jose, last week. I don't remember what you said exactly, but I was a drug user. My family was not here, a womanizer. I paid for two abortions. I lived on a couch. I was a loser, a drunkard. I mean, all these things. So you need the new birth, and I don't because I didn't do any of those things. I grew up in church. <laughs> and Nicodemus was that civic religious leader of high standing. He's devout to being good, and he's devout to punishing people like Jose Prado that weren't that good. This is why, this is why the eternal kingdom of God that Nicodemus is searching for is a free gift of life given by grace and received, not earned, simply by faith. Again, Nicodemus may be flush with moral accomplishments, yet there is someone out on the street right now addicted to something that is as, as far as God and equally as lost as Nicodemus is. It's not about improving some areas in my life so that now at least I'm, I'm, I'm better. Listen, Jesus did not come to make bad people better or good. He, he came to make bad, dead people live. That's what the new birth means, and it's something that only the Spirit's work can do. It's called the Savior's way. It's complete regeneration of my spiritual existence. And this may very well be the case for the person sitting here that even for years and decades is yet to experience the Spirit's work bringing life to their soul, identifying to the weight in their heart. And you could perform all your life. You could have grown up in church. But being born again is a supernatural work that is accomplished by grace given to me as a free gift. And now my heart is responsive because my heart is not stone anymore. It's, I've been given a new heart. I'm not accepting Jesus into my old heart. The Spirit gave me a new heart to receive Jesus by faith. Being born again is more for the religious person than it is for that person out there. It's more subtle for them, which is why Jesus says, I'm that risen snake in the wilderness. It's pointing to when Moses was, was dealing with a rebellious Israelite community. And we should be going back to, to Egypt and snakes bit them and caused death in their camp. And Moses was told by God, make a, a bronze serpent and raise it. And every time someone sees it, it's a serpent we have in our hospitals, they will be saved. Jesus is that serpent. That when he is raised on the cross and exalted, and we look to him, we experience new birth. It's what happened to Martin Luther, right? It's when the Spirit does such a mighty work in our lives that he reveals to us our inability and bankruptcy before God. And all I can do is say, Lord... I've got nothing to offer. That's it. All, all I can do is say, Lord, here I am. Broken pieces, but brought together, mended in whole by the amazing grace of God. What do I need to do to experience that new birth? What do we got to do? Some people are going to say, man, yeah, you know what? I've been inspired to do some, to change things in my life. I've been inspired to begin to, now you know what, I, I gotta start reading my Bible more. I have to start praying more. You guys have a prayer service on Monday nights? You know what, I need to start going to that more. 
Yes, we do want you to come to prayer service. But that's not the response we're looking for. The thing that I need to do to experience new life, please listen, in the work of the Spirit, is simply come to Jesus. Just come. I mean, this is a powerful passage, amen? But I love verse 2. It says there was a man by the name of Nicodemus that came to Jesus. Later on in John chapter 5, Jesus tells and rebukes the Pharisees and he tells them, You search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life, but it's they that lead to me. And in verse 40 he says of chapter 5, But you're not willing to come to me so that you may have life. We know Matthew 11, 28, 30 to 30 well. Come to me. Come to me. All of you who are weary and burdened. And I will give you rest. Rest from what? Rest from the weight of my soul. That I cannot perform or carry anymore. That I will drown in. That I will die in. That, I, that will lead me to destruction. Jesus says come and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Amen? So as we now call up the guys so that we can, by the elements that we will share for our communion time, this is our opportunity to come to Christ. In every other aspect or fear of life, we are expected to work hard, to perform, to achieve, to grind, to earn our way to success and growth. But when it comes to the rest and assurance of our souls, God brings eternal life in Christ as a free gift. Please listen, those that are here. He does not leave us when we fail. He's not, he's not going to respond like the world does. He will not judge us on the basis of our ability to perform. He will not run away from us when we mess up. He will stick with us over and over and over and over again because of the gospel that represents Christ when we come to him. It is given to us by grace, received by faith, and then if works come, they, they follow as a fruit of that faith. But it's time to see Jesus for who he truly is. Amen? Join me in prayer.